she was Antoni Brentano, the wife of a merchant. Beethoven had a close relationship with the couple. My angel, my all, my very self. Much as you love me, I love you more. I can only live either wholly with you or not at all. No one else can ever possess my heart. Never, never. Your love makes me at once the happiest and the unhappiest of men. Continue to love me. Never misjudge the most faithful heart of your beloved. Forever yours, forever mine, forever us, Ludwig. I was ill because I didn't want to leave Vienna. My husband's work meant that we had to go and live in Frankfurt and I, I just couldn't bear it. How is she today? No, but I'm afraid. It's good of you to come. Shall I play something for her? Yes, please. I'm sure it would help. It always does. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, I'll go back to the office. There is still a lot of work to do before we leave. Thank you, my friend. His music told me everything about his feelings for me and I would have given up everything for him. We loved each other deeply but he loved my husband as well and I just don't think he felt able to cause so much pain to a friend. I would have gone with him. But Ludwig... Well... Perhaps when it came to it, the, the idea of a married life was, was something best kept as a dream. Because his music would always come first. I may no longer be a man, not for myself, only for others. For there is no longer happiness, except in my music. Beethoven was devastated by the breakup of the affair. It put an end to the illusion that he could ever find a normal family life. And I don't think it's a coincidence that at this time, his hearing began to deteriorate more rapidly. Added to this, the money from his special contract with his aristocratic patrons had stopped. The effect of crippling inflation under the rule of France meant his backers couldn't keep up their annuity payments. I went to his lodgings to see how he was. He wasn't at home. But what I found shocked me. Everything just seemed to go wrong at once. He seemed broken, so unhappy, and suddenly extremely hard of hearing. Although that may only have seemed worse due to the malaise that now engulfed him. 
He sent me a letter in which he seemed to be in a bad way. By then we had not seen each other since our argument. By all accounts, he had become so neglectful of his person as to appear positively dirty. A chance meeting with his brother Carl, now ill with tuberculosis, gave Beethoven the opportunity to claw back his family in the most extreme and desperate way. I must speak plainly. The reason you are in trouble is that Johanna has none of the qualities that make a good wife. None. Don't worry. I will look after little Carl. But you must make me the sole guardian. Hmm? Hmm? She's his mother. Yes, 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 yes. And so she shall remain. But this... This document will give me certain rights, you see, to look after your interests, you, the father, the Van Beethovens. Hmm? So, here, Carl. Read. Sign, Carl. Carl. That's right. Much as I am convinced of the open-hearted disposition of my brother Ludwig van Beethoven, I desire that after my death he undertake the guardianship of my surviving minor son, Carl van Beethoven. I do not know what drives a man to want to separate a child from his mother. I can only think that he wanted a family of his own, so mine was the obvious choice. Pushing my weakened husband, who so close to death could not stop him, was beyond worldly explanation. Beethoven's behaviour seems incredible to us now. But he genuinely believed he was protecting his family from a woman who he saw as a completely unsuitable mother. And by a bizarre twist of fate, his belief in his own rectitude and his sense of his standing as an artist were about to receive the most colossal boost. His freedom opera, Leonora, was chosen to be performed before the crowned heads who were assembled for the Congress of Vienna, which redrew the map of Europe after Napoleon's downfall. Retitled Fidelio, some of the most dramatic changes to the work were in Florestan's aria. He places extra emphasis on the word Freiheit, or freedom, in an incredibly high-pitched conclusion that's almost impossible to sing at the very limits of a tenor's range, forcing him, like Florestan, into a state of exhaustion and physical breakdown.
This time, the opera was a success. Its universal themes of triumph over adversity and hope over despair were embraced by audiences yearning for peace after the turmoil of the Napoleonic Wars. Professionally, Beethoven could do no wrong. Fidelio had made him the most sought-after composer in Europe, but privately his life was unravelling. His brother's illness and his worsening hearing were conspiring against him. I remember the performance of the trio he had written for me. I was so looking forward to it. In certain passages, my dear friend pounded on the keys until the strings jangled. And in others he played so softly that whole groups of notes were omitted, so that the music became unintelligible. Please sign this, Carl, for our son. Give me your hand. It is a great misfortune for anyone to be deaf. But how shall a musician endure it without giving way to despair? I have found it necessary to add to my will that I by no means desire that my son be taken away from his mother, but that he shall always remain with her. To which end the guardianship of him is to be exercised by her as well as my brother. God permit them to be harmonious for the sake of my child's welfare. Humiliated, Beethoven never performed in public again. This is the last wish of the dying husband and brother, <laughs> Karl van Beethoven. With his brother's death, Beethoven's incredibly productive and innovative heroic period was over. The next decade would be dominated by a bitter custody battle with Johanna for his nephew Karl, and a slow and agonizing descent into near total deafness. But once again, he would find a triumphantly defiant musical response by composing works so radical that even to our sophisticated and knowing ears, they still have the power to amaze. <laughs> 